Welcome to the graduation ceremony of the 2020 AT&T Aspire Accelerator Program. I am so excited to celebrate all of you, even though we have to do it at a distance. Six years ago, we created the Aspire Accelerator Program to find, support, and mentor the most promising education technology startups. Since then, AT&T experts in fields from finance to 5G have helped these companies grow, and they've helped define how students connect and use technology to prepare for promising futures. Today, I'll be joined by some of my teammates from across AT&T and WarnerMedia, AT&T Mexico, and Vrio, as well as the thousands watching online to celebrate eight companies innovating during this distance learning era. And today's event includes our Pitches with Purpose competition. Each of our eight entrepreneurs will give a three-minute pitch to get your vote to decide which of them will win $25,000 in our annual Audience Choice Award. It's up to all of you watching to decide who walks away with the prize. This award means a lot to our entrepreneurs, so your vote is really important. But that's not all. We have an esteemed panel of executive judges you'll be hearing from soon who will select one winner who will get a separate $25,000 from our Calpesh Award. The Calpesh Award celebrates the life of someone many of us knew well and who made an incredible impact on the Accelerator program, Calpesh Patel. Calpesh devoted nearly two decades in AT&T's Mergers and Acquisitions Group, and his passion for entrepreneurship and innovation inspired everyone who had the opportunity to work with him. The winner of the Calpesh Award will need to demonstrate leadership potential, competitive advantage, a strategic business model, deep impact, and overall opportunity. But before we begin with Pitches with Purpose, we want to have a discussion about the important topic of distance learning. With the onset of a global pandemic this year, everyone has experienced changes to their daily lives. As students, parents, and educators adjust to distance learning, AT&T is committed to driving positive outcomes in education. We're driving policy reform at the federal level to close the digital divide, and we're putting financial resources behind the problem. We established a $10 million distance learning fund at the onset of the pandemic to support organizations that were helping the home learning environment. And we recently committed another $10 million to provide free AT&T internet service to help the nation's most vulnerable students stay connected. All of that is in addition to the hotspots and the discounted service we're offering to students and teachers through our Business Solutions School offering. This is a timely and relevant topic, and we are delighted to have three special guests with us today to explore the power and the promise of connected learning and to talk about how we can best ensure equity for all students in this new era of learning. Joining us today, we have John Stanky, our CEO of AT&T, along with Mayim Bialik and Sal Khan. Dr. Mayim Bialik is an incredible actress and author and holds a PhD in neuroscience. Sal Khan is the founder of Khan Academy, longtime partner to AT&T and no stranger to the challenges and opportunities of online learning. With that, I'll hand it off to them. John, Mayim, and Sal, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Charlene. Sal, Mayim, thank you very much for joining us today. You're really kind to do this, and it's great to have you both here. Thank you. So let's jump in maybe right at the moment we're sitting in, which is the COVID dynamic. And Sal, let me go to you maybe to start this out and talk about with the result of the pandemic, it's created some challenges and opportunities. Uh, what's your point of view of what's happening right now in that regard? Yeah, so the, the, the challenges are pretty clear. Uh, this is a suboptimal situation, I would argue, for, for everyone. And I'll be the first to say that I'm sometimes associated with online learning, distance learning. But uh, to be clear, if I had to pick between an amazing teacher and amazing technology, I'd pick the amazing teacher every time. And if I had to pick between in-person learning and distance learning, I'd pick in-person learning every time. Uh, some of the most obvious challenges, digital divide, uh, 20, 30 percent of, uh, of the population in the U.S., especially in a lot of you know, lower resourced urban areas uh, don't have sufficient internet access, even where uh, we've seen the school districts and philanthropists do heroic efforts to get devices and telecom companies like yourself, like, like AT&T, uh, making heroic efforts to get the uh, internet access out there. 
uh, we've still seen five, 10 percent of the kids just not be engaged. Uh, I have a, a teacher who shares my cul-de-sac with me and she's telling me, and this is in a middle income neighborhood, still five, 10 percent of her, her students aren't able to uh, show up uh, for whatever reasons. And what we're seeing is you're having you know, people talking about like K-shaped recovery in the economy. Uh, it really should be like a less than sign. I always get a little confused, but you know, you have you have you have a lot of folks who are doing fine. It's still suboptimal for them, and actually, data is starting to come in that middle income up, you know, kids of college educated parents are actually pretty much they're they're continuing to progress. But a lot of kids, either because of disengagement or the school's not able to support them as much, or the digital divide, uh, their gaps are becoming larger and larger and larger. So. That is, I think, going to be the ultimate question as we go through COVID. And that was always the case, and COVID has just made it worse. The silver linings are people are putting more energy than ever behind the digital divide. Uh, you have a whole generation of teachers who've been thrown into the deep end of the pool on technology, which has been awkward and uncomfortable, uh, and they've been doing heroic efforts. Uh, but that will help post-COVID. Uh, they'll be more comfortable using some of these tools. A whole generation of parents and teach and students who have had more engagement, especially parents, with their children's education than they might have had for, for some time and are starting to develop a very strong opinion about what is working and what doesn't work. We're seeing educators start to, you know, really ask the questions that we'd like to think people have always been asking. But, you know, when you're when you're teaching on video conference and say, well, how do I get the kids to engage? Well, I got to I can't just lecture at them. That might as well be a video. I've got to pull them out of the screen. I've got to put them into breakouts. I've got to ask them hard questions, do a Socratic dialogue. Well, those are good principles all of the time. Uh, so I think that's a benefit. And and then, you know, we are seeing districts do creative things. Uh, there's a lot of suboptimal things about distance learning, but there's a lot of potential uh, flexibilities where you could have one teacher in a district who really is the expert on that topic, be the lead teacher for the entire district. Uh, or you give access to for uh, certain courses that your class, your school might not already offer. Uh, so, you know, we'll see how it all pans out, but I am worried about, you know, that bottom of the of the K or or, or the less than sign or whatever you want to call it. Those are they're good observations, and maybe we'll come back to the discussion on technology and access in just a second. But before we do that, Mayim, there's been a lot of discussion around what it's like for young children to learn from home in this kind of an environment and what's occurring with people's brains from a development perspective, from a neuroscientist perspective, what do we know thus far and what are we worried about and thinking about in this environment? Um, well, I do appreciate, you know, being, uh, being used as a neuroscientist for this conversation, but also I'm a mom, you know, I'm a mom of a 12 and a 15 year old who um, happened to have always been homeschooled and Khan Academy is one of the things that's been a, a benchmark of our education, but um, they also do learn in person because, you know, as as was just said, um, there is nothing like human interaction. And no matter how sophisticated our technology is, no matter how sophisticated our adaptation to technology is, nothing replaces human interaction. You know, and I'm, I'm one of those people who's so grateful for the technology we have and for the ability that we have to have distance learning. But for many, many children, especially now that we have this consciousness, which we didn't have growing up, that Every child learns differently, and some children especially have difficulty sitting in one place for an extended period of time or don't learn well when they can't have that human interaction. I mean, with all due respect, it doesn't take a neuroscientist to say this is this should not be something that that children get used to. And we're all trying to find ways that we can work around it. But I think also a healthy dose of we all need to give ourselves a break and be kind to ourselves and our children during this during this pandemic because we're all being impacted the same way. What happens from that obviously will be based on resources, but we're all feeling the stress, the anxiety that impacts our children's ability also to learn and sit still. It's extremely stressful. So it's uh, you mentioned the the dynamic around each individual and the and how they learn and you are you've been homeschooling your children for a long period of time. Is there a a personalization dynamic that suits well to this environment that's you know kind of better to than all in person or how do you kind of balance that out? Um, I mean, for for us, when our kids were little, you know, they they had social interaction with other kids, but schooling was was really us. 
um, now that they're older, you know, once they basically started entering junior high, we started integrating them into, you know, smaller classes in our homeschool community. Um, but the fact is, the social interaction that happens when learning is important. And, and the socialization that happens when we learn to interact also with adults who are teaching us, that's important. I mean, I, I've taught for several years after getting my degree, and I've taught in our homeschool community. I cannot imagine trying to teach my students th through this format. I just couldn't. And I'm not saying it's impossible and that we should all throw up our hands, but I think uh, um, a serious consideration needs to be needs to be thought about that there are children. I mean, if I was a kid right now, I'd lose my mind being told to sit in front of a computer for, for even four hours a day. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I don't mean to say it's not normal, but I say that in an attempt for us all to understand that, you know, w this is not our job right now to get used to something that is so exceptionally, not only difficult, but counter to the way our brains are wired to interact and to learn. Yeah, that's true. Sal, have you picked up anything during this period from a personalization perspective in the curriculum that our new learnings or is everything that we're doing today kind of what you had picked up prior to the, the pandemic uh, onset? Yeah, it's kind of a, you know, it's a lot of a lot of folks have been talking about pre pandemic, but it's just worse now. Uh, you know, we've always talked about this notion if let's pick on math. We know 70% of kids who go to community college have to take remedial math, a, a, a pretty close proportion for even four year colleges. I remind folks remedial math is not 11th grade math or 12th grade math, it's sixth or seventh grade math. Uh, and the reason why that happens is in a traditional model, kids are kind of shepherded together at a fixed pace. They get a, you know, I, I can't tell you how many middle school classes I visited where the kids haven't mastered their multiplication tables yet. And you can imagine if you just don't know what seven times eight is, or if you have to recalculate it that every time when you're in middle school or high school, uh, and you only got 80% when you uh, learned decimals or 90% when you learned negative numbers, when you see an algebra equation that involves seven times eight and dividing you know, by decimal and some fractions, the cognitive load is going to be incredibly difficult and you're gonna have to, you're gonna start disengaging. The teacher's likely to start watering down the material to at least have the appearance that you're learning it. And we we know that this, this is happening at scale in the American school system where seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, it gets, gets get more and more watered down. By the time you go to college, that's the first time that they're saying, wait, we don't even think you're ready to learn algebra yet, even though the K through 12 system was nominally teaching you algebra one, algebra two, all of all of these things. And so the, the key issue here, and every teacher knows it, you have 30 kids, they all have these gaps because they were shepherded together, 10% here, 20% there. How do you fill them in? And you know that's what we've always tried to work on. You know the ideal use case, kids could use Khan Academy on their own, but half of our usage in this, the ideal use case, is to use it in conjunction with with a teacher. And ideally, if kids can get the practice, fill in their gaps, get support when they get into a room. To Mime's point, they can have more human interaction, not less, so that the teacher can do more focus interventions with the kids who need it. Ideally, even pair up kids who can teach each other. If all of the students have mastered a certain concept, maybe have a simulation, have a game, have, have a project. You go into the COVID world, uh, these gaps that I've just talked about are getting worse. And it really is right. looking like this you know, K-shaped recovery thing. And so we're going to need to put even more energy behind personalization if we don't want to lose a, a, a pretty large generation of kids. Yeah, it's a, to both of your references on anxiety in this process, one of the things I hear from parents that are having to, you know, teach children right now, it's the reacquaintance with math <laughs> that is driving the dynamics <laughs> in the household. <laughs> so I'm thankful I don't have to go back through that. I think my calculus would be a little bit rusty right now. So Sal, you mentioned earlier, you talked a little bit about access to tools and education, and you identified the fact that there's still some gaps out there, but there, there has been a lot of focus in this area. And in some cases, there's been some progress. You probably have seen some things that maybe have worked well in terms of taking a step in the direction of closing down the digital divide or improving the tools that are available for a virtual learning environment. Can you share some observations or thoughts of what you've seen that is working with you as well? Yeah, you know, pre-COVID, to, to give our collective selves credit, uh, the U.S. has done a pretty good job closing the digital divide in schools. Uh, so, you know, with the E-rate program, you know, when, when I was kind of 
starting on the Khan Academy journey, you know, back in 2008, 2009, I would visit a lot of schools and a lot of schools, especially in, in, in poorer neighborhoods, did not have sufficient internet access uh, in, in their schools. Over the last 10 years, there's actually, it's, it's very few schools that I visit that don't have sufficient internet access to use tools like Khan Academy or, or other things. Uh, but what COVID put a big spotlight on is the digital divide at home. Uh, the silver lining, as I mentioned earlier, is that folks are, are, you know, corporations, philanthropists, government, districts are making huge efforts to close uh, that, that digital divide. So I am hopeful uh, that over the next, you know, year or two, you know, some school districts have actually already uh, done it for the most part. We can close it. And, you know, the pitch I always make, you know, I'm not like a policymaker. Uh, but, you know, when I look at these trillion dollar stimulus programs, it's, we've already done two rounds of it. I'm guessing we're going to do a few more rounds of it. It's an area that we're refocusing ourselves on here at AT&T, both from a philanthropy perspective as well as trying to elevate the policy debate in this regard and ensuring that we start to, you know, think about how, frankly, what is already a fair amount of money that's put into subsidy gets directed in a little bit more effective fashion moving forward. So um, I, it's a, the really good points and we're gonna do our part to kind of get the muscle behind it and see if we can make some progress. Cause to your point, there's been some pretty good awareness brought in. So my, there's this constant interest on companies like ours that require great technical talent, I think broader in society for a competitiveness perspective it's an important issue, and I know it's there's a passion from your perspective. How are we doing on getting more female talent pursuing STEM education, and what are we seeing that's uh, helping us down that continuum, and where do we still have some gaps and opportunities to maybe improve the attractiveness of a STEM discipline for, for female candidates? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the we can be as, as big or as small as you want. I think we're doing pretty good um, in terms of trying to put, you know, a, a positive and in many cases a, a female face um, on STEM. I think for me, and this really speaks to, you know, to, to Sal's brilliance, for many of us, it's that it is a closer interaction that's needed um, to gain access and information. And um, for me, that was true as a, a young budding female scientist. Um, I needed to I needed to see women who were doing what I thought, I might want to do. Um, so I think a notion of mentorship is super important. Um, and I think sort of elevating the conversation that the way that we introduce STEM subjects to females is not to say, what's the science of lip gloss, which is very interesting. And for those of us who've been through chemistry and biochemistry, it's fascinating. Uh, but the notion is that um, science is accessible to, to both males and females. And while not every single human needs to like every single thing the same way, um, really just expanding our conversation about what it means to be in the STEM field. Uh, for example, if I had known or if someone had talked to me in depth about the possibility of working with animals, working in the field, working in the you know environmental sciences, um, it, it might have been more attractive to me than the notion of the lone scientist in a laboratory, which is, I think, kind of a lot of the image we see in the media in particular. Um, so, you know, super grateful that I got to play a neurobiologist on television and am a neuroscientist in real life. Um, but it shouldn't take that level of notoriety to say uh, that, you know, being a scientist is a, a fantastic and, and creative way to live your life and to view the world. Um, and in particular, I'm wearing a derivatives necklace right now. Um, my knowledge and understanding of math is also it's one of the favorite languages that I speak. Um, so I, I think we're, I think we're doing OK and obviously we will do better. Yeah, I suspect yeah. the approach to uh, educate in neuroscience and then get to play, you know, that role is a fairly narrow swim lane for a lot of people, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably even narrower than becoming an NBA star, right? <laughs> that is, yes, I'm a very elite uh, academic. <laughs> I think that's the case. Uh, so, you know, Mayim, you mentioned earlier the efforts you're using with your children to in, kind of create smaller cohorts to do some of the social indoctrination that, that's necessary with a homeschooling approach. But, you know, Sal, Mayim, have you seen anything in the approach from a virtual and blended environment that helps with some more of the soft skills indoctrination that everybody needs to be successful? moving forward, some of the creativity dynamics, collaboration with other dynamics 
that have been useful techniques or approaches? Um, I can go first with more of the fun answer, and then Sal can probably give more of the uh, the, the clinical answer. Um, you know, for me, um, really decreasing the stress in our home, increasing play, um, increasing a real appreciation for learning that happens all of the time, which is one of the reasons, honestly, that we do homeschool and we, we school throughout the year. Um, learning is part of simply being a human. It's not something that you um, have to do as a, a prescription to sit in a chair and be unhappy. So for us, the kind of integration of understanding learning as part of being a fantastic homo sapiens sapiens um, and, and trying to decrease the general um, anxiety surrounding learning, to see this as something that does stay with you forever. I use math every day. I use my appreciation of the natural world every day. It adds to me as a person of faith. Like all of those things, for me, that's sort of how we view, you know, our integration of learning. And I've heard from a lot of people during this pandemic that they're finally getting it, that being around your kids more because they're working from home, getting to be part of the process of their brains, which is not just what they do in a classroom. It's not just what they do in front of a computer. It's how they function in their entire existence. So many parents are saying to me, I get why you want to have more of a blended education because you get to see that learning happen and it does inspire you as an adult person. Now I'll let Sal answer from a more clinical place. <laughs> no, well, I mean, on, on a bunch of layers, you know, on a personal layer, my three kids, you know, they attend a school that, you know, I, I'm very active in, I, I started it. So, and, and the school has always been uh, focused on, uh, you know, students having agency, being the center of their learning. It's mastery based. So that means we assess them, but it isn't like, you know, when you get a C, you, you know, you get a big C on your forehead, it goes into your permanent transcript and your view, you don't think you're a smart kid anymore. If you have an 80% on something, the school says, well, you should keep working on that either now or later, but at some point you should master the concept. And what we find is when you do that, students don't view this antagonistic relationship between them and the material or between them and the teacher. They view it as a learning journey, just like Mayim said, that the world is here for us to understand. I, as an individual, have agency. Uh, there are certain things that I might have more or less interest, but that changes. I might not think I'm a science person now, but next year I might discover that I'm really excited about science or really excited about math or really excited about writing. Uh, so I feel very lucky on that level. And you know what I try to make sure in my own family is that I mean, our, our school has started to open up a little bit in the hybrid for for the youngest kids. Uh, but even when it was full when it was full distance learning, to to make sure that it is not you know that they're they're still getting socialization, maybe COVID safe in a backyard. Uh, they're still getting a lot of interaction where possible. Myself, my wife, my mother in law lives with us. We're able to still sit down with them, have conversations at lunch, uh, so they get that that interaction at a more macro level. You know what we're trying to work on Khan Academy. It's a yeah, I believe a great place for people to get practice and learn concepts at, at their own time and pace. But one of my dreams has always been to kind of create a social, you know, broader community of learning. And COVID has actually been the opportunity or actually, you know, kind of the fire uh, to, to actually to start doing it. So there's another project that I've just started launching, schoolhouse.world, another not-for-profit. But this is a place for students to tutor each other. Uh, and uh, some some of the tutors are, you know, there's a professor in the UK who's a tutor, but some of them are 14 year olds. Uh, but we've already seen incredible interaction. There's actually a 40 year old factory worker who got laid off, who's learning his GED, trying to practice for his GED. He's been tutored by two 13 year olds and, uh, and, and he's doing really well. And what's exciting about that uh, beyond a, a human story is if you think about even the future of assessment, you know, right now we look at grades, we look at test scores. But imagine if you saw an applicant to a university or an applicant to a job who's a great tutor, then you have no doubt that they know the subject matter, but even more, they have the, they have the social emotional skills, they can communicate, they can empathize. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that kind of being the future of how we evaluate people and how we motivate people. How much can you give to other people? So that's uh, both good counsel, but let me uh, kind of wrap it up here. We've got a, some folks that are paying attention to this discussion today that are entrepreneurs themselves. And each of you have had you know, some unique experiences and trying some different things in your career. If you were to give one piece of advice to these creative individuals that are looking to kind of go down the path of their own entrepreneurial endeavor, what might be your one suggestion to them? And Mayim, let me start with you. 
Oh my goodness. I mean, well, my, my COVID baby was that I'm starting a podcast on mental health, um, largely brought about by, um, you know, what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, and what I know other people are experiencing. So um, it's called My MBLX Breakdown. I might as well give it a plug while we're talking about it. Um, but honestly, the the experience that I've had um, is, you know, I, I decided to do it on my own with a couple business partners. And that's actually been fascinating because it's so easy to kind of go the corporate route, as it were, um, and take the path of what you think is least resistance. But um, for me, what I've learned is that passion matters. Um, doing it the way that you want so that you can do it right the way you want also matters. Um, and that's been actually really, really um, empowering for me, because although people assume that I have a tremendous amount of confidence, I'm actually incredibly insecure and have a very hard time making decisions. So to be able to say, I want to do this mental health podcast and I want to do it right. I want to do it the way that I believe there are people who want to hear about mental health um, and to trust my instinct on that and really surround myself with people um, who could be supportive and get it done the way we believe it should. That's actually been huge for me. So that's my, my COVID baby, as it were. <laughs> yeah, the passion to start anything is always a really good ingredient for success down the road. Yep. So what would you tell somebody? What would be your one suggestion of, uh, you know, the ingredient that they need to kind of start that entrepreneurial drive? Yeah, you know, my, my flavor of entrepreneurship that kind of attracts me is, you know, if you're interested in a space, get your hands dirty and roll up your sleeves. You know, a lot of y'all know Khan Academy started with me tutoring my cousins 16 years ago. And even back then, in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, I, I want to, I've always wanted to do something bigger in education. I could use my cousins as, as, as guinea pigs, so to speak. And, you know, I was lucky that I had a boss at the time. I was an analyst at a hedge fund. Uh, who said, no, you should have other interests. It makes you a better thinker or a better investor. So I had that time and space. So my one big piece of advice is, no matter what you're doing, um, have carve out some time and space for for your your passions, your your interests. Uh, it, it'll actually probably enhance your day job. And the other thing I'll, I'll give too, you know, the, the root of the word passion is really suffering. I remember when people say the passion of Christ, I was like, he got crucified. It was because it, it means suffering. And so when you really are passionate about something, you will suffer a little bit too. And so just be prepared for that. Uh, but And so I also recommend meditation. And I think That's part of my podcast. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you were both able to put in a pitch here while you were here with us. So thank you very much, both of you. Great insights, a great topic. I appreciate your time and sharing. I hope you all stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an insightful conversation. Thank you, John, Mayim, and Sal. Knowing that leaders like you are so passionate about solving this problem is inspiring, it, and it gives us hope we'll soon be making significant progress. That progress will be helped in part by the AT&T Aspire Accelerator, which has been leading innovation in education and empowering dynamic entrepreneurs to reach their full potential for more than six years. We've supported 43 companies that have impacted over 45 million students and secured more than $48 million in additional funding after our investment. More than 70% of our accelerator entrepreneurs are women and more than 50% are people of color. In a world where too many investment dollars overlook minority-led organizations, we are proud to support these companies, especially as they lead the industry in providing equitable opportunities to students all around the world. So let's spend the next 30 minutes getting to know some of them. This is the part of the conversation where I hope everyone watching pays very close attention. You are about to hear three-minute pitches from each of the eight companies in this year's cohort. And as I mentioned earlier, following the pitches, you, this audience, will vote for the Audience Choice Award winner, who will receive $25,000 in additional funding. And then our panel of esteemed judges will award one company with the CalPESH Award for another $25,000 in cash. That's $50,000 we're giving away today. So let's meet our judges, who have been so gracious to volunteer their time today. Our first judge is Ann Chow, CEO of AT&T Business. Ann? Thank you, Charlene. I'm thrilled to be judging Pitches with Purpose again this year. One of the things that I'm looking for from the pitches today is the leadership potential of the founding team. I'll be listening for relevant or lived experience, appropriate skill sets, and the ability of the founder or founders to execute on the vision they present. Strong leadership, as an important ingredient 
for any lasting business. Thanks again for having me here today. Thank you, Anne. We are thrilled to have you involved again. Our next judge is David Huntley, Senior Executive Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer of AT&T. David, can you share with us what you're looking for in these pitches? Thank you, Charlene. I'm excited to be here again this year. I'll be looking to hear about the business model for each of these companies. I'll be listening for how they make revenue and whether their operation is sustainable. Our goal with the Accelerator is to create long-term, lasting change, investing in strong, sustainable businesses. Thank you, David. Next up is Steve McGaw, Senior Vice President, Corporate Strategy and Development of AT&T. Steve, can you tell us what criteria is important to you? Sure, and thanks, Charlene, for having me again this year and for recognizing our friend Calpesh again this year. I'll be focused on competitive advantage. I'm interested in what makes each offering unique, how it might compare to competitors, or maybe even more importantly, how it might compare to the status quo. I'm looking forward to all the pitches and thrilled that AT&T has an equity stake in organizations like these and make a positive impact on our world. Thank you, Steve. And speaking of impact, that brings us to our last judge, Angela Santone, Senior Executive Vice President of Human Resources at AT&T. Angela, it's wonderful to have you back with us for Pitches with Purpose. Would you mind sharing with your audience your thoughts on what is most important to you in these pitches? Hi, Charlene. Thank you so much for having me. You know, one of the key goals of the AT&T Aspire Accelerator is to have an impact on underserved and underrepresented communities. I'll be listening today to understand how each of these solutions impacts the education landscape, and in particular, how the solution helps prepare learners to graduate high school or for their careers in general. Thank you so much for including me in this competition. I can't wait to watch, and best of luck to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, Steve, David, and Ann for judging again this year. I can't wait to hear the pitches too, so let's get to the competition. Each entrepreneur will have three minutes to share information about their company, the problem to be solved, the solution they're developing, and most importantly, the impact they're having on students, teachers, and parents. We've sorted the eight companies into three categories. The first is skills building. These companies are developing innovative solutions to help learners build traditional hard skills like math, science and reading, as well as 21st century skills like critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. We know that all of our learners need to develop these skills to succeed in the workforce of tomorrow. So in this section, we will hear from Fiveable, Purpose Project, and Almost Fun. Hey there, my name is Amanda Doamaral. I'm the founder and CEO of Fiveable. We're building a social network for education unlike anything we've ever seen. I was a teacher. I taught ninth and 10th grade history in Oakland. And in my time at that school, what I found is that the educational inequities that exist are completely overwhelming students. They don't really know how to navigate the system, who can help them, how to, you know, a lot of these factors in their education are just like out of their control. And so what we're building at Fiveable is about creating learning communities where students can learn together, where a kid from one state can learn with a kid from a completely other part of the country and actually help each other to, to succeed. We started first in AP because that's what I taught. I was an AP teacher. And honestly, Fiveable began because some of my former students were just asking me for help. And so we've created study guides that are actually driving a lot of the traffic to our site, videos, trivia. Um, our teachers also host different live streams. Some of those are like cram sessions that happen right before the exam. Other times we're practicing essays throughout the year or actually working on collaborative projects together. And our community spaces are where students are engaging on topics, not just about academics, but also like politics and um, black history and LGBTQ and climate change. Ultimately, what we've seen is that our kids absolutely love Fiveable. They feel like this is the way that remote learning should happen. And they felt like, like as one of our students said, it really feels like a family here. Just in the last, in the last three years since we've started, we've actually supported over 2 million students. And now we're seeing even over 100,000 students per week. 
So our students actually succeed on the AP exam almost two times better than the national average, just 92% pass rate of just earning money for future college classes. And our main mission is to create more access for students. With AP, we can actually give them access to every course, to expert teachers, and really building their confidence in risk taking, especially in an academic setting. So this is just the beginning. AP is just the first place that we're starting, but there's a whole lot more to do to support high school students with academics, with electives that, of subjects that aren't even taught at school, and with career exploration. How do we get students by the time they graduate high school to have a better idea of what they wanna do next? Our team is just truly amazing. We are a number of former teachers, designers, um, very data-driven people that are incredibly mission focused. That's our main goal. Uh, and we're based in Milwaukee. So we'd love for you to help us out as we embark on this adventure. Um, connect us with teachers and schools, enroll your students, let any AP student know that Fiveable is here for them at fiveable.me. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Minnie Bredo and I'm founder and CEO of Purpose Project. The Purpose Project started with a conversation. Four years ago, I met Karen, who had just recently dropped out of college. She said, I wasn't sure why I was there. Yeah, I'd like to go back, but I don't wanna waste money until I know why I'm going. As a first generation college student myself, I knew exactly what she was talking about. And this challenge isn't unique to Karen or myself. In fact, almost 50% of students report feeling disengaged in school, meaning that it's not always so easy for them to see themselves or their interests represented in their learning. And as the future of jobs changes before our very eyes, it's more important than ever that we teach students to be self-directed, resilient, and purposeful in their pursuits. The Purpose Project is designed to put students back at the center of their learning and enable young people to explore, define, and pursue what matters most to them. We do this through an immersive digital curriculum that makes purpose tangible for students everywhere. Here's how it works. Each learner takes a research back quiz that helps determine what their specific needs and goals might be. From getting motivated to building community and, or to advocating for themselves and their ideas. Then they begin a custom journey through a series of skills and activities to help grow that sense of purpose. Each activity is interactive and versatile for any learning environment. And we have over a dozen skills that range from hope to expression, self-direction to advocacy. Most importantly, this was designed hand in hand with experts, educators, and over 120 young people. As students develop these skills, they can track their progress in a digital tool, and they will emerge from the program with an impact project and a plan for what's next. We've already impacted the lives of thousands of young people to date. Last year, for example, after using the Purpose Project, students who felt they had a clear path after high school increased by 37%. And most importantly, students are finding their unique voice and creating real impact in the world around them. Deja, for example, started a petition to, to protect DACA that raised over 30,000 signatures and raised $3,000 that she donated to the Child Protection Act. Or Catherine, who merged her love of creativity and activism to redesign the woman's basketball shoe to be better representative of the female athletes at her school. She said, the Purpose Project helps you discover something inside of you that you might not have ever found. To ensure the greatest impact, we have two products, one that's designed for educators, which provides facilitation and measurement tools, and the other that's designed directly for young people as a digital app that puts purpose in the palm of their hand. We invite you to join us on our mission by connecting us to schools, educators, and parents looking to help young people find their unique voice and use it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Wong, and I'm the founder and CEO of Almost Fun. We are a technology nonprofit that provides culturally responsive and inclusive learning resources that empower and engage the learning of low income and BIPOC students. I'd like to introduce you to one of those students today. This is Alia. She's incredibly smart and incredibly creative, but she really struggled to engage with and connect with the learning resources used in the classroom, leading her to disengage and really struggle with the material. And Alia is not alone. There are 29 million low income and BIPOC students just like her. And from an early age, we start to see gaps in proficiency across ELA and math emerge. 
These gaps persist, resulting in lower high school graduation rates. 50% of students who don't complete high school say that they left school because classes were not relevant to their daily lives or careers and they struggled to engage with the content. So what we're really talking about is not a learning gap necessarily, but an opportunity gap where low income and BIPOC students are not being given the opportunity to leverage their prior knowledge within the classroom. If you take a look at this 12th grade reading list, you can pretty easily see that BIPOC authors and their stories are not well represented here. And context is important. Most pieces of learning content include a context and a core skill, like connecting sentences. If the context is unfamiliar and the core skill is unfamiliar, the student is left frustrated, unsure of where to approach understanding from. But what if we put that same core skill in a familiar context? Within that familiar environment, students are able to leverage and build upon their prior knowledge, strengthen that core skill, and achieve mastery. And that's what we're doing at Almost Fun. We provide inspiring and engaging learning content that is accessible through a mobile app and website, which are always free. We have over 400 different questions spanning core skills across reading, math, and writing. We provide relevant and relatable math lessons that explain core concepts through the lens of something familiar like a vending machine, or a pop culture reference like the LeBron versus KD debate, or a social issue like underrepresentation in medicine. Through pilots, students tell us that this is the first time they've enjoyed learning and that they learn better this way. Quantitatively, we've also found a statistically significant correlation between usage of Almost Fun and SAT score change, with students who practice over 40 questions on our platform seeing over a 60-point increase. Since the new school year began, with digital learning in full swing, usage of our platform has grown at 10% week over week, with about 4,000 students using our platform every month now. And as we continue to expand our reach, we plan to engage the content sources we use through sponsored content opportunities. We can uplift questions from content that companies are looking to promote to generate earned revenue while continuing to grow our content library. If you have kids who are struggling to engage with their learning right now, Almost Fun is here to help. You can check us out at almostfun.org. And if you're interested in chatting more or supporting us, email us at founders at almostfun.org. We hope you'll join us in our mission to achieve educational equity for all students. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, Minnie, and Lisa. Our next category is innovative engagement. Students today thrive in thoughtful learning environments that offer engaging experiences. That's why these companies are uniquely positioned to provide, like dropping into virtual reality experience or entering an immersive world where you can actually live within your science experiment. So up next, we have Immersed Games and TechRow. Only 22% of graduating high school seniors are proficient in science, which leads to only 29% of adults in the U.S. having enough scientific literacy to be able to read and understand the news. And we know that this drop-off in STEM engagement starts in middle school. And one way we can help address this is with a shift to more authentic experiences with active problem solving. But how do we do this in the constraints of a classroom every single day? So that's where we come in. Title Online is focused on middle school and empowers students to actually do science. So let me show you how this works. First, teachers use Taito to engage students. Students set up a character and enter an alien planet set in the future. And our engagement works. Last year, we saw 30% of students choose to play more at home. Then we fascinate students with real science phenomena. They get to explore real examples like the zombie ants in the rainforest by going there. They investigate the ant colony, collect data, and figure out what's going on. As one of our teachers said, we help create what real science is like by providing this direct experience versus teachers relying on passive watching of videos or reading articles. And what's really critical here is that we use a video game to let students directly engage in science engineering practices, building that critical scientific literacy. We reach students directly through schools and districts where we sell Title Online at $10 per student with all content included. And schools have even more need right now due to COVID-19 and how difficult it is to do active, authentic problem solving in their learning activities right now. And during spring, we experienced a 25 time increase in signups from teachers due to this need. We also saw more student engagement with 200% more quests per student completed over the summertime. 
and we're grateful to have had grants from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Education helping build our product and conduct research showing it works. So for example, with our NSF pilot, we saw a 12% increase in science and engineering skills after using Taito. So since creating Taito Online, we've incorporated strategies to support underrepresented students, such as breaking down stereotypes with inclusive representation and showing STEM careers are collaborative and they make an impact on problems that students care about. But we now know that research shows that traditional biology learning can accidentally introduce racist misconceptions. So if biology education is a context where these biases develop unintentionally, then it should also be a place where they are challenged intentionally. So now we're taking our work a step further, building intentionally anti-racist content into Title Online. So for example, when studying genetics, we examine sickle cell anemia and directly address why it's more common for black people in the US. We break down potential misconceptions as we look to similar conditions impacting people from many racial backgrounds based on their geographic heritage. So please join us in engaging students deeply in science, transforming a diverse generation to scientifically literate students who know how to do science. Hi. My name is Travis Feldler and I'm the founder and CEO of TechRow. TechRow is an education technology company that's working with organizations all around the globe to boost engagement and learning through virtual reality technology. Students deserve to have rich learning experiences, no matter their backgrounds and from anywhere. But unfortunately, disconnected students around the globe are losing the opportunity to learn. Connected students are not discovering the joy in learning. So we gave the education market of VR solution that is accessible offline and meets educators where they are most comfortable. And guess what? It works. Students anywhere can imagine themselves as marine biologists swimming with dolphins to study echolocation. Good job. Students from anywhere could also empathize with children in refugee camps impacted by civil war in Syria. I like Tech World World Funds because the VR is awesome and I get to experience the other lives that the people are dealing with and the situations in their community. And students could even create their own VR experiences to increase awareness on important issues. So like, I would make like a VR experience about politics and tell people how really important it is to like vote because that's speaking your voice, speaking your mind. Through the power of pressing play, homeless students in Los Angeles can go on VR university tours as part of college readiness programs, making the American dream real. Through the power of pressing play, children that haven't seen their friends in school for months can see their creative VR work on our platform through VR festivals in New York City. Through the power of pressing play, a nonprofit in Indianapolis that takes cohorts of disadvantaged students on study abroad excursions can continue to deliver services by taking students on VR field trips to Spain and beyond. Their students still being able to soar despite not being able to physically fly from this pandemic. Our Harlem roots draws on its Renaissance history and commitment to social justice. In Harlem, Despite having some of the widest achievement gaps in the New York City public school system, we felt that it was the perfect place to solve real education problems. It has sparked our growth, landing us in the two largest school systems in the U.S. in a very short amount of time. And our world-renowned media network, distributing the best content in the market for all to experience in VR, makes our movement strong. You, too, can join our movement by signing up on techrow.org. See you on the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay and Travis. Our last category is social emotional learning. 2020 has brought unforeseen learning challenges. How can educators support students when they're not sharing the same physical space? This category of pitches focuses on the process through which children understand and manage emotions like setting emotional context for learning, giving students voice through gratitude, and developing game-based strategies to reach our neurodiverse students. These pitches all focus on helping students identify and manage emotions so they can show up fully and ready to learn. 
This last group of pitches will come from Social Cipher, Give Thanks, and Click Engage. Hi, I'm Vanessa, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Social Cipher. We're a game-based social emotional learning platform for neurodivergent youth. And I'd like you to meet Ava. She's autistic and growing up, she's told her behavior is abnormal and unwanted. This leads her to be more likely to face loneliness and isolation and 10 times more likely to die by suicide compared to neurotypical peers. Ava works with the counselor for social emotional support. However, current learning tools are out of touch, patronizing and unengaging. And for middle to high school age youth, engaging social emotional learning curriculum hardly exists. I know Ava's problem because I lived it. I was diagnosed with autism at 14. And after I learned how the world viewed me, I felt I needed to be fixed. I felt broken. And I suffered from years of depression and anxiety and low self-esteem. Over the years though, with the help of my mom, I learned how to interact with others in my own way. And that was through stories and my favorite music and movies and games. I realized that I never needed to be fixed. I wasn't broken. I just needed a different way to learn. And that's why I founded Social Cipher. We're a social emotional learning platform that connects neurodivergent youth and their advocates in an immersive virtual world. Our platform consists of two components. The first is our episodic game series, Ava, which follows the space pirate adventures of an autistic star mapper. Core social emotional competencies are woven into each interaction through our dialogue system, and all elements of Ava are regularly tested with the autistic community. The second component of our platform is the companion browser app, which allows counselors and teachers to track social emotional progress and remotely stream gameplay. Overall, for professionals, our platform is a super engaging tool to help youth practice social emotional skills. To players, it's just an exciting game that they would actually pick up on their free time. We've been supported by fantastic partners and a growing AVA community, and our team's expertise spans ed tech, game development, and autism advocacy. Our team is inspired by real stories, and every decision we've made in this game is for neurodivergent young people, right down to the name of our main character. Ava is a real kid and our first play tester. I saw myself in her, and it broke my heart to think that she might face the challenges that I did. That made me determined to help her feel seen and understood and empowered. And based on our playtesters' feedback, we've seen that we're making that impact. Students see themselves in our stories, and 100% of them want to keep playing. I believe in a future in which neurodivergent youth can understand and embrace their differences to achieve magnificent things. And the Social Cipher team is going to make that future a reality. If you'd like to find more about fundraising or our pilot program, reach out to us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amra and I'm a co-founder of Give Thanks. I'd like to tell you about Kai. Kai is a second grade student and sometimes he acts out in class. And even though he's just seven years old, he started to believe the message that he's a bad kid, which makes it harder for him to succeed in school. In 2017, one in five children suffered from a diagnosable mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. 2020 has only made things worse Classroom learning has been disrupted, and so has life outside of school. Now more than ever, we need to help children develop the skills to nurture their own well-being. How can we help them feel strong, safe, and resilient so they can reach their full potential in school and in life? What if students can develop these skills themselves using a simple expression? Think back to a time when someone sent you a thank you note. Did you feel seen and appreciated? It may seem like a small gesture, yet whoever sent you that note exercised a skill by reflecting on the impact of your actions and then expressing how they felt. That is what Give Thanks is all about. We are a nonprofit founded by people with deep roots in education. Give Thanks strengthens student well being using gratitude science. Students send digital thanks notes to recognize positive actions in others, they see their own impact through the notes they receive. Teachers monitor student notes for safety. Students support each other in developing critical skills like empathy, self-awareness, and compassion. Our second grader, Kai, did not get along well with his peers. 
Like many kids, in addition to academics, he had to deal with things like bullying, social anxiety, learning disabilities, and racism. Give Thanks helped Kai develop skills to overcome those challenges and change the trajectory of his relationships with his peers and teachers. More importantly, Kai improved his self-esteem and engagement in school. In a rigorous research study, the Give Thanks program demonstrated results. After just six weeks of use, it increased students' well-being and life and relationship satisfaction and decreased anxiety, depression, and negativity, especially for boys. At the end of our program, Kai shared this note with us. Give thanks makes me feel happy and welcomed in my community. When I get notes, I can see that people care about me. We joined the AT&T Accelerator this past year in the midst of the pandemic. Since then, there's growing demand for Give Thanks in K-12 schools across the country. We have an opportunity to overcome this crisis of well-being with gratitude. Students and teachers have sent 200,000 thanks notes so far, and we want to reach a million. We need your help to build awareness and grow the program. I'll end with two important words. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Pratt and I'm CEO and founder of Click Engage. And I know it's been a long day and a lot of us are carrying heavy emotional backpacks into the spaces we enter into. But I'm hoping that you can actually take a second with me and use your imagination. Can you imagine with me that you're eight years old and that when you arrive home at night, you're met with the sounds of your parents arguing over various life stressors. When you wake up in the morning, it's to an empty household and you have to walk yourself to school on an empty stomach. And then when you finally arrive at school, you're expected to sit in a desk and learn as if none of those things have happened to you. This was my experience growing up, and this was the experience of my students in Miami-Dade County, but this problem is not specific to my ecosystem. It affects more than 49 million children across the America in the form of trauma. What's worse is that less than 15% of those children actually receive any of the services that they need. These complex traumas have lasting psychological and academic consequences for students. And as an educator, I wanted to support my students, but due to limited class time and a lack of capacity, I could not know what my students were bringing into my space until it was too late. I needed something that could tell me what my students were carrying into my classroom so that I could be proactive instead of reactive. I needed something like Click Engage. At Click Engage, we work to ensure that every child feels psychologically safe and supported in every environment. We do this by amplifying student voice and giving teachers critical data that they need to actually be proactive to those students' needs. And the way it works is simple. Students self-report their emotional well-being daily through our scaled survey system. Based on the results, they're grouped into different color categories where they're given targeted coping mechanisms that they can use throughout their day. Then the teacher receives this information in real time so that they can make pivots in their instruction and provides interventions to students that really truly need it. But the best part is that this information actually rolls up to the school level where the school administrator gets a school-wide wellness report to make sure that they can keep a pulse point on how their entire student body is doing every single day. We are serving schools and districts directly. And this year alone, we have grown from serving 1,000 students to serving nearly 5,000 students. We have a national partnership with Teach for America, and we started churning revenue so that we can expand our impact in the coming year. We are a team of leaders who are passionate about ending educational inequity in the form of providing mental health access. And we know we can meet our mission. We just need folks like you to jump on the train with us and bet on us the same way many other organizations already have. Thank you, Vanessa, Amara, and Samantha. All right, audience, it's time to vote. And you can begin voting now. Open a browser and go to the URL that you see on the screen now. While you're making your selection, I'm going to ask our producers to run a quick recap video so you can remember each of the companies and their solutions as you cast your vote. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Lisa Wong, and I'm with Almost Fun. We provide culturally responsive and inclusive learning resources designed to empower and engage low-income and BIPOC students in their learning. Hey there, my name is Amanda Doimerall. I'm the founder and CEO of Fiveable. We're building a social network for education unlike anything we've ever seen. Hi, I'm Amra with Give Thanks. Our digital program strengthens student well-being using gratitude science. We help students develop critical skills like empathy, self-awareness, and compassion by sending and receiving thank you notes. I'm Lindsay with Immersed Games, where we're using our video game title online to engage students deeply in science, transforming a diverse generation to scientifically literate students who know how to do science. Hi everyone, I'm Samantha with Click Engage, where we bring everyday emotional awareness to the classroom and help students flourish through a fast, safe, and easy SEL tool aimed at providing psychologically safe and supportive environments for all students. I'm Minnie Bredo with Purpose Project, and our digital tool enables young people to explore and define purpose in their lives. Hi, I'm Vanessa, and I'm with Social Cipher. We're a game-based social emotional learning platform for autistic and other neurodivergent youth. Our space pirate adventures help young people and their advocates find social emotional success beyond the screen. Hi, my name is Travis Felder and I'm the founder and CEO of TechRow, and we're leading an immersive learning movement through virtual reality technology. What an impressive group of change makers. Their passion is evident and I'm in awe of their accomplishments. Okay, I'll ask everyone to finish voting in the next 20 seconds. Okay, time is up for voting. While the team tabulates those results, we'll announce the winner of the Kalpesh Award. Now, as a reminder, our four judges, Anne, David, Steve, and Angela, have viewed the same pitches that you've just watched and scored them across five categories, leadership potential, business model, competitive advantage, impact, and overall opportunity. May I have the results of the Kalpesh Award? The winner of the $25,000 Kalpesh Award, Immersed Games. Congratulations, Lindsay. Hi, thank you so much. That's so exciting. And thank you so much to the judges with Anne, David, Steve, and Angela. Um, and of course, at t The Accelerator has been an incredible experience with so much support from at t we even did a summer camp with them this summer, um, virtually supporting students in Rochester, um, and the amazing cohort. I've learned so much from the other founders here as well. So yeah, I definitely appreciate and I'm thankful for this award and the recognition, and we are committed to living up to it and being a leader and continuing to work on building our engaging science content, helping scientific literacy, and of course, our culturally responsive and anti-racist work that we're so excited to be able to do more of. So, okay, I think that was long enough. Thank you. <laughs> well, congratulations again, Lindsay. We can't wait to see the impact of your work. And thank you again to Anne, David, Steve, and Angela. Now, may I have the results from the Audience Choice Award? Okay, the winner of the $25,000 Audience Choice Award is Social Cipher. Congratulations, Vanessa. Oh my gosh, we are so overwhelmed. Thank you so much um, to just everyone in the Accelerator in this cohort, at t and uh, Most of all, to my incredible team. Um, the folks that we've worked with are some of the most brilliant, genuine, and passionate folks I know. And we are just so excited. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations again, Vanessa. We can't wait again to see what kind of impact you have on our students. So thanks to everyone for joining us today and participating in this event. With a special thank you again to our judges and to John, Mayim, and Sal. Thanks also to everybody at at t who helped mentor our companies this year and to the talented CSR team that operates the Accelerator and makes all of this possible. And finally, to our extraordinary Accelerator graduates, congratulations. 
we're all inspired by your passion and your dedication to students everywhere. They have brighter futures because of you. We all look forward to watching your continued success. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you for joining. To learn more about AT&T, subscribe to this channel, visit the AT&T Newsroom, or watch more videos in the playlist seen here.